Okay, so, uh, oh, that's really loud, sorry. Um, that's, uh, this is making me sound really, really nasal. Uh, and for some reason, I can't adjust the volumes. Okay, so it's interesting to see the different responses for the uh, photosynthesis paper. Um, so for those people who put E, uh, good luck to you, I guess. Um, so ca can you guys hear me from the back? Is it really echoey? Kind of? Okay, because here it sounds really, really bad, so I apologize for the uh, microphone here. Okay, so um, uh, this, is, this is actually my last lecture with you guys, so it's quite exciting to, to, to be back. Oh, I know. Um, so I want to talk to you guys about population genetics today. Um, so get your mind out of this photosynthesis mode and start in the photos, uh, sorry, population genetics um, mode. So this is, uh, this is not part of the, ge the genetics module is part of the evolution module, so you do not need this for your test in week 10. Okay, you need it for the one in week 13 and for the final, but not for the one in week, uh, week 10. Okay, so let's flick back to that. Okay, so before we get started though, I want you guys to really clear your mind because population genetics is one of those things that is um, really, really difficult to understand. And especially if you're bringing in preconceptions about alleles, about you know, genes and this kind of stuff. Okay? So I really need you to clear your mind. That's why I was showing that really nice uh, set of pebbles. Those pebbles stress me out sometimes because it's like, how do they balance? You know, when they fall down? But I want you to clear your mind, de-stress, uh, because we will be trying to go through a very, very complex thing. So you thought photosynthesis was complex. This is probably equally complex. It's different complex. Okay? All right, so uh, before we get started, though, I want to talk briefly about these uh, words you guys have been the speakers are really awful. Uh, those words you guys have been listening to and hearing about uh, recently. And so one of the words that is quite important when it comes to population genetics is this idea of a locus. Okay? So a locus is singular, the plural is loci, and all it means is that it's a location on a chromosome. Okay? So if you have a person, okay, and you zoom in on the person, it looks a bit like this, and then what we can do is that inside the person, obviously the person's made of cells, the animal, the rabbit, whatever, is made of cells. And so we can draw a cell up. Um, and so in that cell, obviously that's a really bad cell, inside cell there's a nucleus, okay? And in that nucleus there's chromosomes, there's DNA and things like that. So what you want to think about is that that DNA, my tablet has just decided to fall asleep. Okay, so... Ugh, very strange. Okay, so in that DNA, in that uh, nucleus, you've got DNA, and DNA exists as these strands, right? And so these strands is just a, a, an unbroken stretch of DNA. Each strand is one unbroken stretch of DNA. But the thing is, each of these strands has different things along it, different A's and G's and T's and C's. And depending on where you're on it, um, a lo particular location is called a locus. Okay? So it's like an address. A locus isn't just an address. And so you can have an address, which is up here. So these two chromosomes, left and right, they come, uh, the homologous chromosomes. And so one comes from mum, one comes from dad and they both have this address on them, this location. Okay? Further down in the chromosome, maybe there's a different address. Okay? So in this address, there lives something else, but it's still a locus. It's a different locus, but it's still called a locus. Okay? Now, when you think about genes then, genes are actually just the piece of DNA, so just a little bit of this chromosome, and it's a functional bit of this DNA. Okay? It maybe encodes for a protein, may do something else, but it's just something that exists at one of these loci, okay, and it does something for the organism. Okay? So a gene could encode a protein, for example, and maybe there's a gene up here that determines your hair color, for example, your eye color. Now, lots of different chromosomes, lots of different locations, lots of different addresses, and then each of these addresses has a particular gene, maybe, or maybe there's not a gene there, there's something else there. But then if there is a functional sequence there, a gene, then there could be differences in the sequence at that particular place. Okay? So for example, maybe at this bottom location here, okay? maybe this location reads G-A-T-T-C. Okay? Maybe at this location, where's my pen? Maybe at this location, it reads G-T-T-T-T-C instead. Okay? So the different variants of that DNA sequence is what we term an allele. Okay? So it's a different type. And the thing with alleles is that you're used to writing alleles in terms of big A, little a, big B, little b, it doesn't actually matter what you call them. Okay? So we could very well call this one, this is allele A1, this can be allele A2, it doesn't matter. We could call it BZ and RG or whatever. It doesn't matter what you call the alleles, as long as you know what you're talking about in terms of these alleles. 
Okay, so that's what you've been doing so far in genetics, and that's talking about an individual. Okay, so it's talking about one single person, the individual, but today we want to branch out and think about populations. Okay, so think about how these populations work in terms of their alleles, in terms of their genes, their genetics. Okay, so just to define a population, it's a community. It's a, it's a, it's a group of the same organism living in a particular place, and importantly, they breed. Okay, so this population, you know, they're breeding with each other, it's all very nice and that kind of stuff. And that's what forms a population, the same species breeding together in a particular location. So genetically, populations differ quite a bit from individuals. Okay? So individuals are, are finite. We die, we live, we die. That's a bit sad, but anyway, it's true. Um, and our alleles, in a way, that we contain ourselves will die with us. But the population is essentially immortal. As long as the population can keep surviving in a particular environment, that population, generation after generation after generation, it keeps on living. Okay? So the population itself is immortal. In terms of variability, that's an interesting one, because in the individual, in the individual, we have a fixed variability. Okay? We either have, you know, for example, if we've got, if we've got the big A, little a allele, that's it for life. Okay? That's our genotype for life. We can't change that. There's no difference. It's not like you know, we can decide one day to become a big A, big A. Okay? Or if our genotype is A1, A2, we can't decide someday to be an A1, A3. Okay? But in the population, it's, it's variable. It's pos possible to have variability. So for example, this guy up here. Okay? So this guy up here could be an A1, A2. Okay? And this person over here could be an A2, A2. And this one over down here could be an A3. A2. Okay, so there's variability that's possible in a population because you have lots of different individuals and they all have different alleles. And in terms of genetic change, this is also quite interesting because in an individual we can't change. Okay? Um, if we're A1, A2 as our two alleles for a particular, particular gene, we can't change that throughout our life. We can't suddenly say, just because I'm eating more healthily, I'm going to become an A1, A1. Okay? But the population can change. Okay? So say there was a calamity and everyone with an A2 allele died out, in the next generation, you're going to have different setup of those alleles. Okay? So population uh, is genetically changeable, genetically variable, but an individual isn't either of those. Okay, so when we're thinking about the alleles in these populations, uh, we think a bit differently than thinking about alleles in individuals. So for example, here's an individual. This particular individual has those two homologous chromosomes, and the two alleles that they have is A1 and also A2. We call, call it big A, little a, it doesn't matter. Okay, so A1, A2, and let's just highlight all the alle alleles in the other uh, people in this uh, population. Okay, so when we're thinking about this population, we say, okay, well, we have to figure out how these alleles exist, or how many of these alleles exist in the population itself. Okay, so we think about one of these people here. So this A1, A1 person, for example. So if we zoom in to his face, we can see his DNA, okay? And the chromosomes here, we're just saying we're looking at the A locus. So it's just the address, one address in his chromosomes. Okay, and since this guy is A1A1, he's got those two A1 alleles. We say on the chromosome, here's an A1, and here's an A1 as well. Okay? If we go come down here to this guy and we zoom into his face, we see again those two DNA strands, and on those DNA strands we have A1, on the other one we have A2. Okay, so that's his genotype, those are the alleles that he contributes to the population. So then if we think about the entire population of eight people here, so it's a very small population, um, but this population of eight people, how many chromosomes like this do they have? There's eight people. And each, well, there's eight people and each person has two chromosomes, and so that means there's 16 of those alleles flying around in the, uh, in the population. Okay? So we can say the number of alleles is actually 16. Each person has two alleles. If there's eight people, there's 16 alleles. And then for this uh, next calculation here, number of A1 alleles, we literally go around the population and count. Okay? So we go up here and we say, well, there's an A1 here, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, so we say there's 8 of these A1 alleles present in the pool of the population. Okay, so that's 8 over there. 
And we can do the same for A2. And if we count all the little A2s, all the alleles present in those populations, we can also count there are eight A2s. Okay? It's a bit depersonalizing and dehumanizing to think of it this way, but that's what population genetics is. Okay? So we have 16 alleles floating around in the population currently. There's eight of those A1s and there's eight of those A2s. Then we think, okay, well, proportionally, how many are there? Okay? If there's eight of the A1s, Okay. It means that there are eight A1 alleles in 16 total alleles. Okay. Because if we literally just do the counts, we have 16 alleles in total. We have eight of these A1 alleles. And so the proportion the, of these A1 alleles is eight on 16. And we do the same with the A2 calculation too. So we can say the, the proportion is also eight on 16. Okay, so half of all the alleles in this population are A1s, and half of all the alleles in this population are A2. Then we think about this special word called frequency, and frequency often confuses students because um, it, it sounds a bit funny. Okay? But frequency just means proportion, chance. Proportion, chance, frequency. And so we write frequency a bit like this. So we, so we do F, little f, and then brackets, and then A1. So this is asking us, what is the frequency of the A1 allele? And the second one's asking us, what is the frequency of the A2 allele? Okay, so the frequency, the proportion of the A1 allele is, again, just 8 over 16. Okay, we normally write these in terms of decimals, and so this is just 0 0.5. And the frequency of the A2 allele is 8 on 16 as well, and that's also 0 0.5. Okay, so here we've got a way to start describing what's going on in terms of the alleles, the genetics of our population. We can say that in this population as a whole, if you just ignore the, the fact that there are you know, human beings there, in the population as a whole, there are 16 alleles floating around. Half of these alleles are A1s, half of these alleles are A2s. Okay, the thing is, when you think about populations, a population is very complex. Okay? We don't have just one gene in all of us. We've got 30,000 genes, and each one of those genes has thousands and thousands of different alleles, and that's why we're so variable ourselves. Okay, so this variability of all the different alleles in the population okay, is called a gene pool. It's the total genetic material that can be worked with in the population. And again, this is assuming that you know, all these people are interbreeding. And so this gene pool, which is the collection of all the A alleles, all the B alleles, or the C alleles, et cetera, et cetera, this is the gene pool. And these alleles actually affect how individuals survive through evolution, okay, or through selection. And so, for example, specific alleles can determine survival and reproduction. So if, for some reason, the A1 allele, or having an A1 allele, suddenly became really bad, okay, this person would die off, this person would die off, this person would die off, and so would this one in the population. Okay? So if having the A1 became bad, then that's what would happen. Okay? Now, if having C3 was bad, okay? if having C, and let's pick a number that's not going to kill everyone, um, if having C2 was bad, if having C2 was bad, then uh, this person would die, but he's already dead, so that's okay. Um, this person would die, but he's also already dead. And this person will also die, but he's dead already, so that's cool. So it really means that these, if there was selection against the C3 and A1 alleles for some reason, um, then this person, this person, and this person would survive to reproduce. Okay? So the alleles are what, what's important in natural selection because alleles determine how the individual survives uh, under selection. Now, if there's no selection, though, if you've got a perfect world, this gene pool technically should remain fairly constant. Okay? So the 0 0.5 and the 0 0.5 we worked out before, as generations breed to generations, breed to generations, these frequencies, these proportions of different alleles should remain fairly constant throughout the, throughout the, uh, the, the story of the generations. Now, they remain constant, okay, given a few certain things. Um, that thing in red is something I forgot to type on, so maybe you could write it into your lecture notes. So the allele frequency, so these 0 0.5, 0 0.5s have worked out already. These allele frequencies should remain constant from generation to generation to generation as long as certain things are met. Okay, so a population should not change genetically if 
there is no mutation, okay? If there is no migration, okay, so people don't move in and move out, then technically the, the gene pool should not change. If mating is totally random, okay, the gene pool should not change. If the population size is very large, the gene pool should not change. And also, if there is no selection for particular alleles or particular individuals, then technically all these frequencies of the gene pool should not change either. But obviously, this never happens or rarely happens in real life. Okay? In real life, you have mutations going on. You have people, animals moving from one place to the other. You have non-random mating. You have this thing called assortative mating, which Madeline will talk about soon. This is where you know like mates with like. You have small population sizes, so populations on an island, you know, they interbreed within each other, a bit of inbreeding going on, that changes these frequencies of the alleles. Okay? And importantly as well, you have this thing called natural selection acting as well. Okay? So in real life, this is all called evolution. Okay? So these various aspects, when they happen, that's evolutionary processes occurring. But if, say, you have an almost perfect situation, then you can have a situation called the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, this is when you have a very large population, there's no mutation, no migration, very random mating, and no natural selection going on. This is what we call a situation called the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Now this equilibrium is named after two guys, uh, so uh, Hardy was this Englishman and Weinberg was this uh, German who were working in the early 1900s, and they came up with this, this theory. And they said all allele frequencies should remain the same from generation to generation to generation, unless there's an external force pushing it somewhere. Okay? So this external force is obviously evolution that we know now, and Madeline will talk more about evolution in her lecture next, next week. So this, uh, this, funnily enough, reads very similarly to Isaac Newton's uh, theory, or not theory, first law of motion, which says an object remains at rest uh, or moves constantly unless acted upon by external force. So if this was in, turn it in, uh, Hardy and Weinberg would get it. Okay, so. The, the, the thing with working out um, these allele frequencies is that you need to get lots of practice in doing this because otherwise it gets very complex. And so I'm going to fix up my computer because my tablet's playing up. Uh, but this is printed on your, on your things. And so I want you to give uh, this question a go. And answer on Socrative, uh, type, in a, type in an answer. Oh, yes, you can talk amongst yourselves to answer this. There are some good answers coming out. Um, so think about what we've talked about before. Just count the alleles, count the total alleles, and then count the number of alleles of each type in this population of 100 rabbits. OK, so that's good. So we've got P equals. Uh, We've got 0 0.4, 0 0.6 sometimes, and 80 and 120. We've got rabbit food. <laughs> We've got 64 and 120. That doesn't add to 100 um, or 200. We've got smiley face. Okay, so what we might do, let, let's have a chat about this. Um, if I leave that on the screen, you promise not to type naughty things? Okay, because this one's recorded, so that, that one's not recorded, so that, that's okay. Okay, um, 
<laughs> okay, so is that going to be? Oh, it's going to be distracting. Okay, let's turn it off. Oh, I'm going to miss you too. Okay, so let's have a think about uh, how this works then. Um, we've got 100 rabbits. Okay, 100 rabbits. These rabbits are deployed. Therefore, how many alleles do we have at this particular locus? 100 rabbits. So, 100 rabbits. Okay, and in each rabbit, there's those two chromosomes. We'll just ignore all the other chromosomes, just draw those two. Okay, so in each rabbit of this 100, there are two alleles possible. Okay, which means that there's 200 rabbits, sorry, 100 rabbits, there are 200 alleles. Okay, now if there's 200 alleles, let's figure out how many of the big A allele we have and how many of the little A allele we have. Okay, so here in the 16 rabbits, the 16 rabbits have this genotype. Okay. This genotype means that they have, each of these 16 rabbits has two big A alleles. Each of the 16 rabbits has two big A alleles. Okay. In the 48 rabbits here, okay, 48 rabbits, they've got, each rabbit has one big A and one little A, which means if you have 48 rabbits, you have 48 of the big A allele, and you have 48 of the little a allele. So far so good? Okay. And in this rabbit over here, or this type of rabbit over here, you have 36 of them, and each of these 36 have two of the little a, little a allele. Okay. So then we can think about the numbers. Okay. So the number of big A alleles. Each of these 16 rabbits has two big A's, which means that in this group here, we have 32 big A alleles. Each of these 48 rabbits has one big A and one little a, okay, which means that from here we can get 48, okay, 48 big A alleles. From here, how many big A alleles are there? None. Yeah, good. Okay. And then that's the number of alleles, but if you wanted to work out, not the number, but the proportion, pro that says proportion, um, proportion of alleles, then we just need to divide this okay, by the total number of alleles in the population, which is 200. Okay. Writing like this is quite awkward. Um, okay, so 32 plus 48 is uh, 80. Okay, over 200, and as a decimal, this is represented as 0 0.4. Okay, so this is essentially the frequency of big A. We also call this, we can call it a different pronumeral. Let's call it P, little p. Okay? The frequency of little a alleles, similar calculation. Okay? So we, from the left-hand side rabbit, we get no little a alleles. From that middle rabbit, we get... 48, or that middle 48 rabbits, we get 48 of little a alleles. Okay, from that right-hand side, 36 rabbits, we get 72 of the little a alleles. Okay. So the people who were typing up 80 and 120 in the Socrative, you were almost there. Okay? You just had to divide by the total number of alleles, which was the 200. Okay? So, so far, so good. So we've got P equals 0 0.4 here and Q equals 0 0.6. Okay, so this is a description. This P and this Q is a mathematical description of what's going on inside our rabbit population. What we can do is to take it a little bit further. Okay? So we have already worked out P is 0 0.4 and Q is 0 0.6. Now, I want you to think not about alleles now, but about genotypes. Okay, so what's the proportion of what's the frequency of these different genotypes? So, we've listed the big A, big A genotype, we've listed the heterozygous genotype, and also the homozygous recessive genotype. Okay, now this homozygous dominant genotype how many rabbits are there of this genotype? 16? Yep, good. Okay, so it's not a trick question. So 16 rabbits of this big A, big A genotype. Okay? And in terms of frequency then, we have to figure out 
these 16 rabbits in the entire population of rabbits, which is 100 big, that's one zero zero, okay, the frequency of that big A, big A genotype is 0 0.16. If you come down here to the little a, little a genotype, we've got 36 rabbits of this genotype. Okay, so 36 rabbits in 100 rabbits. Let's write the units down. Rabbits is a unit. Rabbits. Okay, this means that the proportion or the frequency of these homozygous recessive rabbits is 0.36, or 36%. Okay, so 36% of the population is little a, little a, 16% is big A, big A, and the rest of the population, the 48 over 100, 0.48, this is the heterozygous genotype. Okay. Now, bonus points to, not really bonus points, but can anyone uh, see a mathematical you know, thing in, this, in these three numbers? 0 0.16, 0 0.48, and 0.36. Sorry? They're all equal to one, good, okay, so they're all equal to one, and that makes sense because all we're doing is figuring out proportions, okay, so if you've got a third of this, a third of this, a third of this, of course, if you add them up, it's going to be equal to one. If you have 16%, 48%, 36%, it's going to equal to one, that's good. Any other mathematical thingy you can see with this? Sorry? Herd ratio or something like that? So 0 0.16 and 0 0.36, what are they num numerically? They're square numbers, yeah, okay, and what are they squares of? They're squares of this, and also squares of this, okay? So, whoa, okay, so <laughs> 0 0.16 is actually equal to P squared, 0 0.36 is equal to Q squared, and what is this equal to? 2PQ, yeah, okay? And what does that look like? P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1, the quadratic formula. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? Okay, so that, that, this, this formula is essentially what Hardy and Weinberg were on about when they said this law. Okay, they said, you know, if the frequency is P and Q, then you can do these calculations and add them up to this quadratic formula thing. Okay? And we'll keep using this as the lecture continues. The other thing I want to notice here is that um, in terms, this is the, this is the genotype frequency. Okay, so genotype frequencies. In terms of the phenotype frequency, okay, so if we draw a big line here and start figuring out the phenotype frequency, okay, this phenotype over here and this phenotype over here, are they the same or different? Same, good. And so therefore, the phenotypic frequency of these two, okay, well, the phenotypic frequency of a grey rabbit okay, will be uh, 0 0.64. So this is the frequency of grey rabbits. And down here, the frequency of black rabbits is equal to 0 0.36. Okay, and that's 0 0.36 in this particular population, which is under this Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, is Q, is Q squared. Okay, so keep that in mind, and we'll go through a few problems a bit later. Okay, so one of the problems with Hardy-Weinberg that people have normally is that it looks a little similar to a Mendelian cross because you're essentially, you know, taking two numbers and you're crossing them and, and figuring out the proportion or the, the, the chance of something happening. Now, on the left on this screen is Mendelian stuff, okay? So let me, again, just revise the Mendelian stuff. You have genotypes in the parents, uh, and then in the gametes, okay, so if this was a particular parent, so this is a parent and this is another parent, there we go. Um, okay, so in terms of the gametes this person, could, this, this guy can produce, what are the genotypes of the gametes? So you can produce two types of sperm, they're not balloons, they're sperm. Um, little a and also big A. Okay. The chance of a big A sperm hitting the egg okay, is about half and the chance of a little a sperm hitting the egg is about half. Okay? Or half of the 10 billion sperm, 5 billion sperm is big A, and 5 billion little sperm are little a. Okay? And for this female, her eggs are going to be either big A or little a, and again, there's a half chance of each of these happening. Okay? Now we put this into a Punnett square, okay? the good old Punnett square, and we think, okay, well, the guy sits up here, 
because uh, that's closest, and so we say this is A, and the possibility of this is 0 0.5. And we say the possibility of the little a is also 0 0.5. We put these guys down there, and we say possibility of A, big A, is 0 0.5. Possibility of little a is 0 0.5. Just a standard Punnett square. It's a one-to-one -one kind of thing. And so when we combine it together, we get big A, big A, little a, big A, big A, little a, little a, little a. And if we multiply these numbers together, we get 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and also 0 0.25. Okay, it's standard Mendelian, Mendelian cross. Now, in this next generation, then, okay, so say these parents reproduce and they have uh, this, they produce the next generation, the the chance of a big A, big A happening, okay, is 0 0.25. The chance of a heterozygote occurring is 0 0.25 plus 0 0.25, which is 0 0.5. The chance of a homozygous recessive happening is 0 0.25. That equals 1 if you add them all together. Okay, so this is the standard 1 to 2 to 1 Mendelian ratio you guys normally see. Now, when you think about populations, again, you're not thinking about just two individuals anymore. You're thinking about a thousand million individuals. And so you can't just think about you know, little sperm, little egg from coming from two individuals. You have to think about a whole population. Okay? So, for example, in this population, it just so turns out if you do the numbers, if you count them all up, okay, if you count them all up, the frequency of A here is 0 0.8, and the frequency of little a is 0 0.2 if you do all the counting and the thing that we've been working with before. This means that if you're a guy in this population, okay, and you average yourself out over the entire population, you have a 0 0.8 chance of giving a big A okay, to your offspring. You have a 0 0.2 chance of giving a little a to your offspring. Which means that the Punnett square, not really a Punnett square, but the, the thing is slightly different. Okay? So here we have the chance of a big A, and instead of 0 0.5, it's 0 0.8. Okay? And the chance of a little a going to the next generation is 0 0.2. Down here for the females, it's, zero, sorry, it's, it's big A at 0 0.8 and little a at 0 0.2. So again, we can multiply this out just like we did for the Mendelian square. Big A, big A, this is 0 0.64. This is big A, little a. This is 0 0.16. This is uh, big A, little a, 0 0.16. And this is little a, little a. 0 0.04. Okay, so again, thinking big populations, okay, thousand, hundred thousand, million individuals. What you have going on here in the next generation then is this box down here represents the proportions of the next generation. Okay, so in the next generation, if you think about big A, big A, big A, little A, little A, little A, okay, next generation, the big A, big A's. How many percent will there be? 64 percent, yeah. Okay. So 0 0.64 proportionally will be big A, big A's, talking about that massive, massive population. And how many will be heterozygotes? 3, 2, good. And the homozygotes will be 0 0.04. Okay. So this is how you think about population genetics in terms of the, uh, the alleles and the frequencies flowing from one generation to the next. Now this next slide is trying to hammer this in a little bit more. Okay, so say in one generation, okay, we're talking about P's and Q's and FA's and F little A's and that kind of stuff. If we think about one generation, okay, it's got P and it's got Q. So what we had before was we had the 0 0.8 here and the 0 0.2 here. Okay, but let's not think about real numbers now. Let's think about you know algebra. Okay, uh, I said the A word. So this is P here and this is now Q. And this is now P, and this is Q. That was just 0 0.8, 0 0.2 in the previous slide. Which means that here, it's P squared. This is PQ, this is QP, and this is Q squared. Okay, so this next generation, this is a representation of the types of genotypes that will be there in that next generation. Now, let's think about not genotypes anymore. Let's go back to this thing called allele frequency. Okay? So, in this next generation, the frequency, oopsies, the frequency of that big A, 
Okay, remember the frequency of the big A, all of these guys have big A. Yeah? All of these guys are two alleles and these guys are all big A's. However, in these ones, okay, half of those guys have big A. And so the frequency in the following generation is going to be P squared, because all of those guys have the big A, plus we have 2PQ, which is the addition of these two. However, only half of those guys have that big A allele. Okay? And so essentially we have the frequency of big A in the next generation is equal to P squared plus PQ. But because we're working with just big A and little a, we know that whatever's not P must be Q. Okay, whatever is not P must be Q, which means that P plus Q has to equal to 1. Okay, if P plus Q has to equal to 1, so this is, draw that as a separate little thing. If P plus Q has to equal to 1, then we can say down here, this is equal to P squared plus P, and then 1 minus Q. Oops, 1 minus P. Okay, and so that will be p squared plus p minus p squared. This is the extent of a biologist's algebra. And then you, uh, you struck those off and you say that equals to p. And so what this, is what this slide is trying to tell you is basically the frequency of the big A in this next generation is just the frequency of the big A in the previous generation. Okay, so this is Hardy Weinberg at work saying that if there's no forces acting upon your population, P will not change from generation to generation, and Q also will not change from generation to generation. Okay, so the whole thing with this is that you need to understand the principles and don't memorize formulas. Okay, you know P plus Q equals 1, that's about all you need to know. So we're going to run through a few practice questions now, or try to, uh, and I want you guys to kind of apply what you guys have learnt uh, on Socrative and tell me what you guys think. Okay, so this first one here, give this one a, give this one a go. Okay, good. So there's been a few, uh, so all the answers coming through so far have been correct. It's good to see. <laughs> uh, I'll show it on the non-recording screen. Okay, so most of the, uh, most of the answers are 0.26, okay, for the ones who have worked it out already. Uh, in the interest of time, the answer, yes, indeed, is uh, 0.26. So let me go through, go through why. Okay, good. So what we've got here is a population. Okay, so it's a fairly large-ish population. The total number of people in this population is 352 people. Okay. So in these 28 people with the genotype LMLM, okay. The number of LM alleles coming from these 28 people, okay, so each person has two alleles, there's 28 people, therefore there's 56 of the big LM allele. Okay? From these 129 people, 
one hundred of people, each person has two alleles, but only half of these alleles are LMs, okay, which means that one hundred and twenty nine alleles are LM. From this, there are zero LMs. Okay? The number of LN alleles, okay, these guys, because they're homozygous for LM, they have zero LN alleles. These guys have 129 LN alleles. And these guys, 195 people, which means double this amount of alleles. Okay, so that's uh, 390 alleles from there. So therefore, if you work out the frequency of the LM allele, this is just going to be 56 plus 129 plus 0, okay, all over 352 people means, and each person has two alleles, which means 704 alleles. And this turns out to be 0 0.2628. Okay? And we can do the same with the FLN. It's going to be 129 plus 390 all over 704, and that's going to be 0 0.7372. Okay, so far so good, hopefully. Now, we can move on and think about, okay, well, these 0 0.26, 0 0.74 are the F of the LM and F of the LN. Okay, so let's just write up here again. F of the LM and is equal to 0 0.26, and F of the LN is equal to 0 0.74. Okay? So, answer this question for me. What is the heterozygote proportion going to be in the following generation? Assuming Hardy-Weinberg. So assuming hardy weinberg holds, what is the LMLN frequency in the following popular generation? Okay, good. So there are some, some good answers out there. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to. Um, other people want to teach you as well. Okay, so, so the 0.38-ish answer is, is the right answer. And it's just because this guy here, okay, remember our P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared thing. Okay, oops, Q squared. P squared was the big A, big A's. 2PQ represented the big A, little A's. And Q squared represented our little A, little A's. Okay? And so the proportion of big A, little a's is given by, literally, 2PQ. Okay? And remember, P and Q do not change from generation to generation if Hardy-Weinberg holds. Okay? So 2PQ here is just going to be 2 times 0 0.326, sorry, times 0 0.74 equals approximately 0 0.38. Okay? I think it's actually 0.39, but it's close enough. Good. Okay, so I want you to try this for me. Um, so stick your finger in your own ear. Uh, the moisture content of your ear is actually determined genetically. Okay, one gene, two alleles. And Asians tend to have dry, and uh, Caucasians tend to have wet, but we'll see how this population goes. Okay, so everyone stick your finger in your ear. Well, you should know kind of what earwax you have. I've never seen wet earwax, so that, that just the thought of it really grosses me out. Um, so can I get your hands up if you've got dry earwax? Dry earwax. I'm going to do a really quick count. Really, like, it's, it's not shameful to have dry earwax. Okay. I think that's about 35 of us with... Uh, so I'm, I'm also dry earwax, let's say 36. Uh, what about wet earwax? 
Oh, okay, there we go. Wait, put your hands up again for wet, sorry. I lost count about halfway. Twenty-eight-ish. There's more than that in the room, so some people didn't stick their finger in their ear. Um, okay, well that's okay. So the total number of in our population here is uh, 564. That's a nice number. Okay, so assuming these 64 people who answered the survey are in Hardy one equilibrium, okay, let's calculate P and Q. This is the trick here. How do we calculate P and Q? All we know is phenotype. All we know is wet or dry earwax. We don't know anything else but the genotype of us. Okay, the people with uh, wet earwax. People with wet earwax could either be big E, big E, or big E, little E. Okay? The people with dry earwax would be homozygous recessive. Okay? Because the dryness is dominant. Sorry, the wetness is dominant. Okay? So how would we work out this, this frequency then? Okay? The thing is, because we can assume Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, okay? and we know that in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, again, P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. Okay. We know that P squared is the big A, big A's, these guys are that, these guys are that. Or in our case, they're E's. Okay. So we can say this is big E, big E, big E, little E, little E, little E. Okay. So proportionally, there are 28 on 64 of these guys. And there are 36 on 64 of these. All right. So can we then say 36 on 64 is equal to Q squared. Get my calculator out here. 36 on 64 equals, whoops, equals, okay, so that's 0.56. So that is 0 0.5625, I think it is. Good, and then if we square root that, we get, oh, that's a nice number. Okay, so therefore, Q is just the square root of that, and so that's 0 0.75. How lovely. Okay, so P, Q plus P, P plus Q equals 1, which means P is 0 0.25. And now we can work out genotype frequencies. Okay, so for example, if we wanted to work out the proportion of these carriers, what we would do is just literally 2 times 0 0.75 times 0 0.25 equals whatever that is. Okay, so 37% of those people who put their hands up and had, uh, sorry, 37% of, of the people who responded, okay, have this big E, little e genotype. Okay. And 56% have this uh, genotype, and I can't do the calculation for that in my head, but the other bits have that genotype as well. Okay. Okay, so let's do this one briefly. And then I realize I've got a, lot, a few other questions, uh, but there's no time for them. So what I'll do is I'll do a video about them. Okay? But try, try this one on for, for size. So this is similar to what we just calculated. Okay, good. So the majority answer so far is uh, is B, and B is the correct answer here. Okay, one in fifty 
It's because, if we draw it up here, the, 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 the people who have CF, okay, the, they're represented by Q squared. Okay? And if these people are one in every 2,500, this just means Q squared is equal to that, which means Q is the root of that. Okay? Q is the root of that, which means Q is one, one on 50. Okay? All right, so I've run out of time, but what I do want to say before I finish off is that um, you guys have been an amazing class. I'll finish off these online. I'll do a little video shoot on this. Um, biology, hopefully you've seen, is an amazing kind of thing. Hopefully you'll pursue it in second semester and second year. As a Christian, um, I see biology as this great way to, to examine what, what God has made. Uh, for you guys, it's something different. But the thing is, I hope that you really have gotten this love of biology in you now. Um, thank you for being a really good class. Uh, you'll see me around anyway, so uh, thanks, guys. Yeah, do you mind if I speak for a couple of seconds before? No, no, no. no. I, yeah, I've done, I've done this lecture bash in this, in this room plenty of times. I'm fine with um,